100 million years before the birth of the first pharaoh, the deserts of Egypt were verdant Edens, teeming with life. At the top of this food chain, dinosaurs ruled. Nearly 100 years ago, a German aristocrat named Ernst Stromer ventured deep into this wasteland, searching for clues to its prehistoric past. The strange monsters he discovered would astonish the scientific community, only to be blasted into dust by man-made fire from the skies. For the next half a century, a hidden world lay buried under these shifting sands until a team of young scientists set out to resume Stromer's quest. Their mission? To unearth the remains of the lost dinosaurs of Egypt. Their discovery? Something so unexpected, it would supply one vital missing piece to the puzzle of a forgotten world. My name is Josh Smith, and I'm a paleontology grad student at Penn. I love dinosaurs. I think dinosaurs are very, very cool. But I study ecosystems that have dinosaurs in them. Spinosaurus was always one of my favorite dinosaurs growing up, but I really didn't know anything about the guy who had discovered it until I was in graduate school. German paleontologist Ernst Stromer discovered the massive carnivore Spinosaurus along with three more species of Egyptian dinosaur in the early part of the 20th century. As with most of Stromer's finds from the African continent, all fossil evidence of Spinosaurus was destroyed in a World War II bombing. I've known about Stromer's dinosaurs since I was probably 10, 11 years old. This man went to this exotic place, found a bunch of incredible dinosaurs, and they were all lost. It's almost mythical to somebody that was, you know, so interested in the subject. Can I get a uh, Boddington's, I guess? What do you want? The seeds point. of a new expedition took root in a Philadelphia bar. All right, so um, when you think about Stromer's it, I think we'd had a couple beers, and we were basically like, you know, if you could go anywhere, Josh, where would you go? And I was like, if I could go anywhere, there'd be this place, this place, and Baharia Oasis in Egypt because of the incredible finds that Stromer made there so long ago. We could bring these things back that had been lost. You know, it would be really cool to see a mounted skeleton of Spinosaurus, no doubt. Oh, yeah. To have, you know, this big... This would be insane. You know, I mean, and as a perfect example of how dangerous it is to lubricate young scientific minds with beer, we decided that something had to be done. After spending six years in the U.S. Armed Forces, 30-year-old Josh Smith began his paleontology studies. So here I am, and I'm nothing but a lowly graduate student, and I'm trying to mount an expedition to go hunt for dinosaurs in the middle of North Africa. And I really wasn't sure I could pull it off. Smith's first step? To approach a veteran of Egyptian fieldwork, Penn geology professor Dr. Robert Giegengak, known to his students as Geeg. I've been in Egypt for more than 30 years and never heard of the dinosaurs of Baharia. So he presented me with all this data about discoveries that had been made 80, 90 years ago. I mean, how hard do you think it'll be to get back to the same places? One thing led to another, and Geeg offered me a spot on his team.
February 1999. Josh Smith accompanies Bob Giegengak and graduate student Jen Smith on a Penn geology expedition to Egypt. Oh, this is a beautiful stretch. Here we go. Okay. Following a five hour drive from Cairo, they enter the Baharia Oasis region, a lush desert island encircled by a wasteland of rock and sand. Due to the tight schedule of their geology research, Geeg and Jin have granted Josh just two days to search for fossil clues to Stromer dinosaurs. Well, we're about 350 meters southwest of where we want to be. I have done a little work in paleontology with Josh before, and given the amount of time that I was going to let him have, I figured there's no way he's going to find anything significant. I'd spent several months trying rather unsuccessfully to translate some of Stromer's old papers with my terrible German. And one place that he kept talking about was this very peculiar, isolated conical hill. I don't see a hill of any sort. That up there is sort of conical. It's not really isolated, though. Well, see, in the, in the yeah. middle, there's... We were driving along when I see these objects. Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, slow down. Okay. Something over there. That looks a lot like bone. I think that's probably the first dinosaur that's been discovered driving along at 45 miles an hour that I've ever known about. Whoa! <laughs> Look at this. I presume, based on size alone, that we probably had a sauropod, a long neck, long tail guys. Oh, this is sweet. I was excited as hell, as you might expect, right. but we weren't there very long. We were trying to find as many sites as we could. In the setting sun, over by the northern part of the oasis, we see an isolated conical hill. I'm looking at this thing, and it looks very much like what Stromer was saying. The next morning, their search continues at Stromer's Hill, Jebel El Dist. The locals call it the Pyramid Mountain. The dinosaur gods smiled on us almost immediately. Hey, Jen. What'd you get? Look at this. We found the limb bone of what is almost certainly a theropod dinosaur, a carnivorous dinosaur, and bones all over the place. I have never seen this many bones littered across the ground like this. At this point, I was pretty sure that we had the evidence that Stromer's dinosaurs were probably still lying out there in that desert. Since the first discovery of dinosaur fossils in the early 1800s, nearly 1,000 species of dinosaurs have been identified throughout the world. From the infamous five-ton Tyrannosaurus rex, to the 40-foot-tall Brachiosaurus, to Compsognathus, tiny carnivore no larger than a chicken. Dinosaurs first appeared in the Triassic period, roughly 225 million years ago, and became extinct 65 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period. Much of what we know about dinosaurs comes from those that roamed the northern hemisphere, but most dinosaurs which lived on the southern continents, particularly Africa, remain scientific enigmas even today. But in 1910, one man would begin to explore that mysterious ancient world. Born on December 5, 1870, into an ancient baronial lineage, Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach spent a quiet childhood near his family seat in Nuremberg, Germany. Small of build and often in poor health, Stromer would ultimately find his calling in the evolving fields of geology and paleontology. In the early 1900s, Stromer learned of some fossilized prehistoric mammal bones recently uncovered in Egypt. At the end of 1910, he mounted his own expedition to see what other fossils Egypt might possess. It was a strenuous journey. 
there were no cars. He had to rely on local means of transportation like camels. He had no plan for provisions. Stromer and his team trekked nearly 200 miles across the desert. It would be eight days before they reached the then primitive outpost of the Baharia Oasis. January 13, 1911. I arrive in Bugwiti and meet with a local official. The official tells me that I probably won't find much. After exploring some disappointing sites, Stromer came upon Jebel El Dist. There he found his first significant fossils, tantalizing glimpses from the Earth's primeval past. January 28, 1911. In cold weather, I search through the hills. I find among these layers three large bones. Apparently, these are the first dinosaur bones that have been found in Egypt. Stromer found a diverse dinosaur fauna with two standout key players, one by the name of Spinosaurus and the other Carcharodontosaurus. We're talking about dinosaurs approaching the size of Tyrannosaurus rex, which was long believed to be the greatest meat-eating dinosaur of all time. No longer is. Move over. You got competition. While Stromer immersed himself in the extinct species of the Cretaceous, his own 20th century species was focused on its most destructive pursuit, making war on itself. In August 1914, World War I broke out, and the material collected by him was still in Egypt. 12 big wooden crates taken by the Anglo-Egyptian officials were not allowed to leave the country. Ernst Stromer's hard-earned fossil finds had become hostages of war. Nearly a century after Stromer's setback, Josh Smith, a former Army sharpshooter, begins to recruit his own scientific team for what he calls the Baharia Dinosaur Project. Show me what you got. This was the biggest thing I had ever done, and there was no way I could do it alone. Much. I needed a team, and I wanted the best minds I could find on it. Set, cut. The first to sign on is Josh's fellow paleontology student, Matt Lamana, who specializes in dinosaur evolution. If someone can inherently know what their path is going to be when they're as young as four, I did. I had never thought of being anything else. This was my dream to become a paleontologist and to get to places like Baharia Oasis. So the barrier island then... Drexel University's Dr. Ken Lacavera agrees to lead the expedition's geology contingent. Ken is an expert in sedimentology, the language of environmental change. We're interested in the paleo environment, what it was like where these dinosaurs lived. The paleontologists are kind of asking the question, what? and we're asking the question, where? PhD candidate Jen Smith joins Ken on the geology team. I'm definitely a rock freak. They're just fascinating, absolutely fascinating to me. Every rock has a story. I try to paint a picture of the landscape that was present when the rocks were being deposited. Josh also needs someone on site who can instantly assess the bone's conditions. He selects Jason Poole, affectionately known as Chewy, to the Star Wars fans among his colleagues. I'm an educator and a fossil preparator. OK, we're going to touch it real gentle, because this is 100 million years old. I first got fascinated by dinosaurs before I can remember. The reason I, I still like dinosaurs is probably my lack of ability to completely grow up. <laughs> my ex-wife will attest to that, and my present one also. <laughs> but there is still one skeptic among the group, Josh's graduate advisor. World-renowned paleontologist Dr. Peter Dodson approves the expedition, but he still harbors doubts. The great question is, are there really prime specimens lying out on the ground? If there are, it will be a very rare and very, very exciting situation. Or is this going to be a colossal bust? 
The pressure was really on. Everyone expects you to be some big dinosaur hunter. You know, bring back the biggest monster anyone's ever seen, something huge and exotic. And that really wasn't what we wanted. What was out there where that Egyptian desert was 94 million years ago? What was the environment like? What did we really lose when we lost Stromer's collection in Munich? That's what we were hoping to find out. Nearly a century after Ernst Stromer left Egypt for the last time, eight scientists and three volunteers from the Baharia Dinosaur Project arrive at Cairo's International Airport. I'm really, really tired. <laughs> In a tight six-week field season, the team hopes to rediscover a world once lost to science. Perhaps even unearth one of Ernst Stromer's lost dinosaurs. Let's go get us a Spinosaur. We were definitely hoping to bring back something cool, but as to what was actually waiting for us buried in the sand out there, we had no idea. From Ernst Stromer in 1910 to Josh Smith nearly 100 years later, it's never been simple for Westerners to make scientific expeditions to Egypt. <laughs> After arriving in Cairo, members of the Baharia Dinosaur Project first meet with geology official Hirat Solomon to gain permission to begin their operations. By the time you come, we will have a much better idea of the number of skeletons and their distribution. Inshallah. Inshallah. Tea is the national drink, and everything really requires a tea drinking. So I, I was never more caffeinated in my life <laughs> than when I was in Egypt. The tea drinking has its rewards. The Egyptians were just fantastic. They basically opened up the whole desert to us. And as long as we returned anything important or anything unique back to Egypt, we could take it all back and study it in America. Their final permissions granted, the team spends several busy days in Cairo, hunting for provisions and tools. It takes a lot of gear to do what we do. We need to buy plaster to wrap the bones, we need to buy aluminum foil, picks, shovels. 15 liter petrol cans. Usually we have to take household items and sort of manipulate them to our own devices. Yeah, it's like, good. take this off or... So what do you want, a couple? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, how many do they have? Shokran. Shokran. Thank you. They don't make things for this discipline, so we just scavenge whatever we can. Masalama. Masalama. Another great benefit of the agreement that we have with the Egyptian government was direct collaboration with their scientists. I think we will be even more fun than Professor Simons. Working with Yusri Medhat and Yasser was really great because we learned a lot from each other, both scientific and cultural. <laughs> this cooperation is a chance to create a new generation of devoted Egyptian scholars to study fossil excavations. It's a shame to have only foreign scholars studying the Egyptian fossils. With land cruisers filled to capacity, the multinational team finally embarks on their five-hour journey back in time. We're out here in the winter because this is the only time of the year that you can work here. In the summer, it's 110 degrees. They say that the desert floor is crawling with scorpions. Even now in the winter, though, it is a difficult place to work. Daily temperature swing can be from 30 degrees to 80 degrees, and you never know quite what's coming. We're driving out here, and I keep thinking that you're lying about how cold it is, and as soon as we get out, we freeze. Get back in the car, we're burning. 
When those bombs destroyed Stromer's collection in Munich, it left a lot of unanswered riddles. How many kinds of dinosaurs were actually wandering around in Egypt? What kind of a world were they living in? What did the desert look like back then? Bawidi, with a population of 13,000, is the largest city in the Bahariya Oasis region. The crew sets up headquarters at the El Beshmo Lodge, located near the edge of town. Do you all have your passports? We should carry our passports with us in whatever is your day pack, at least until everybody here gets used to it. The only other thing that I can think of as far as safety goes is water, sunblock, and the fact that we move in buddy teams, right? We don't go anywhere alone in the desert out here. I don't care how much you've been in the field, how squared away you think you are, we're always in buddy teams, everybody, all the time. Hold up a second. Where do you want to go? I want to go up there to point three. I think it was point three. Want to get out and walk? Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. We're good to go. The first thing we're going to do is hit the things we found last year. I'm thinking what looks right is right there or right back in there. This is exactly the stuff right here. It was this low, easy wash, this kind of weathering feature on a plane just like this. I don't think we're here. But. When he first found this area a year earlier, Josh Smith took exact longitude and latitude coordinates of every fossil site using a global positioning system, or GPS. Now, the same GPS numbers lead only to empty patches of sand and rock. I feel like we're too high. Too high? Yeah. Which way do you want to go? I think it was down there more. Stupid computer. I, don't know I was basically wondering whether or not the landscape had been changed enough by the wind during the course of the year that we were not here for us not to recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. I was sweating it. I was thinking, yeah, I get six years of combat arms experience. I got a master's degree. I wonder what they'd take for me to re-enlist. I don't need to be a paleontologist. We We'd brought along a more sophisticated GPS this year than the one Josh had had, so Ken and I decided to double check the coordinates with our GPS. I think we're, we're just on a different coordinate grid, so all the coordinates might be shifted a little one way yeah. or the other. So we just, just have to. Try. If we, when we get one point, the grids will all line up and we'll have all the points there. We started to hone in on the correct location, and right at the same time that we got there, Josh had recognized the landmarks and had, had found the site visually. Hey! Joey! We came over the hill. I saw that. I was like, right there. I don't know what. Ken and I were happily following the trimble, and it goes right there. So. Oh, yeah, baby. I don't know what the hell Ken's GPS was doing. He gave him the wrong coordinates. How did I give him the wrong coordinates? OK, here we go. Doesn't look very impressive, but that's a bone. They are very impressive. There's bone. Uh, I don't know how exactly how much is here. There's some right here, but uh, this is what we marked. <laughs> OK, I'm going to breathe well, again. This looks like a productive area. To, let's go to it. Divide yourselves up. However you do it is fine. The team continues the first around. phase of their dig the exploratory process called prospecting. When we find a site, we just see an accumulation of bone that looks worthy of putting a flag in it, and we flag it, and we move on. Paleontologists have an eye for bone. We know what bone is uh, on the ground when we see it. We're basically looking for like what we saw before, um, fragments of bone on the surface. You'll see the, the characteristic sort of purple sheen usually um, sort of uh, the series of tiny little holes, essentially the places where the blood vessels were in the animal as it ran through the bone. These are all bone fragments everywhere. This is all bone. This is, this is all Watch bone. Watch where you step. That's a bone. This is bone. All this is bone. Wow. We just found these. 
These, this is all new stuff. This is stuff we didn't find last time. By the end of the first day, the team has marked nearly 100 places where bones appear on the desert surface. We've managed to rediscover everything we found last year, and we found three, four new sites. Not bad for a day's work. We found the first theropod limb bone up there. Professor Peter Dotson has a different point of view. I'm very satisfied with the quantity of bone we're seeing. What I need to know now is about the quality of bone. Okay. We desperately need to find bone in the ground instead of on the ground. So I'm guarded. I'm guarded. Bone preparator Jason Poole shares Dotson's doubts. Josh is really optimistic, but what we were looking at was pretty much stuff that I would call souvenirosaurus just little bits that probably won't really amount to anything. Um, I really don't think it's going to lead us to a skeleton. All kinds of this trail of crumbling, weathered bones could either bring them to a dead end or to the remains of one of Stromer's lost dinosaurs. Surrounded by Egypt's western desert, team members from the Baharia Dinosaur Project begin the next stage of their expedition. Fossil preparator Jason Poole will be responsible for preserving the condition of each excavated bone. He starts the morning mixing up a vital concoction. This is a cocktail later on tonight. Um, <laughs> This is a vinac and acetone mixture, which will work as a, as a hardener and a shellac, um, which is really important in the field if you have fossils that are loose. Uh, after seeing what we saw yesterday, we're gonna need to use a lot of it. Today, we're gonna to go back to the sites that we looked at and then begin what we call evaluation. We're gonna determine whether or not these sites are worthy of being quarries or not, that we'll go in and actually excavate. We basically want to take the dirt off to that level because we think there may be more bones inside, right under me. Being a paleontologist is sort of like being a detective, except all the evidence has been left out in the rain for 100 million years. Yeah, Ilium? In their hunt to find a more complete skeleton, Josh Smith and his crew work a site that may contain a pelvic bone or Ilium from a meat-eating dinosaur. We're following ends of the bone in to see where they stop, or hopefully where they don't stop. Meanwhile, the geology team of Ken Lacavera and Jen Smith set out to solve one of Stromer's riddles. How could this barren landscape have supported so many giant creatures? It looks like we can get up through the big cliffs this way. We're trying to piece together the environmental and the paleogeographic history of this area. There's a fundamental law of geology, which is very simple to understand. It's called superposition, which is the oldest stuff is on the bottom and the youngest stuff is on top. And as we work up, we're working up in time. I'll log the position. Try to get in where it's not so weathered. We'll measure each individual rock unit and we'll describe each rock unit. And we'll try to take as much data as we can that'll let us go from what the rock is to what the environment was. Yeah, it's a rooted horizon, yeah. lignitic. The link Probably between kind of geology and paleontology to me is fairly obvious. If you don't understand the ecosystem as a whole, how can you really understand the organisms? This stuff is all connected. Can say again? We have some bone fragments uh, that we think are bone. It's hard to tell uh, that we'll bring down for you to look at. Nice, can't wait. Excellent. Really? Shoot, I left my opener. There should be more bread around. Screen pass. Oh! Ah. American spiral right there. We have the best job in the world. We get paid to go to really cool places, sit on our butt in the desert with dental picks, and scratch away at old bones. We got the uh, either the king of all fishes up there or some sort of crocodilian. Yeah. I want to see some dinosaurs, man. Fish are great, but, you know. A lot of it, quite honestly, is turning over this fragment of bone and realizing that you were the first organism in probably 100, 150 million years to see this. 
In 1911, Ernst Stromer was the first Westerner to hold in his hands an Egyptian dinosaur fossil. His discoveries included the bones of a bizarre carnivorous dinosaur. The establishment of a new species is certainly justified, which I name for its most conspicuous character and land of origin, Spinosaurus aegyptiacus. Stromer's Spinosaur monograph describes an astonishing creature. Even larger than T-Rex, this five-ton predator possessed a unique physical feature, a five-foot-tall sail of spines rising from its back. We really don't know what the sail on the back of Spinosaurus was actually used for. Some scientists think it was part of a cooling system. Others say it might have been a sexual display feature used to attract a mate. The jaws of Spinosaurus are enormous at approximately six feet long. They actually resemble the jaws of a crocodile more than most carnivorous dinosaurs, which has led some scientists to speculate that Spinosaurus and its relatives may have lived near or in water eating fish. The problem is, Stromer had the only solid physical evidence of Spinosaurus aegyptiacus that had ever existed, and by 1944, it was gone. What do you think of that, Matt? I think it looks like we found our first definitive dinosaur. Yeah, it's a keeper. That's, that's what it is. I mean, what we're looking for. That's what it is. Josh is a specialist in carnivore dentition. Based on the tooth's conical shape and its lack of serration, he is able to identify this as the tooth of a Spinosaurus. We're the first people in 80 years to hold one of these for real. We didn't find any more Spinosaurus material at that particular site. That single tooth was the only physical evidence that Stromer's dinosaur once walked the Earth. I might have been the only one, but I had this feeling in my gut that there was more where this came from. The discovery of the Spinosaurus tooth was nice because it lifted everybody's spirits. But it's been a while, and we haven't found anything else. We're starting to get a little bit nervous. Where's the on button? We have a lot of really highly intelligent people in very close quarters doing really, really hard work. Boot camp was like 12 years ago. I'm still digging foxholes. We're gonna try I think to keep everybody from going insane, there's lots of just silliness. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. Oh, shut I up. wish I knew the words. <laughs> and uh, it's it's great because it keeps your energy level up. You have proven yourself worthy, O Knight. O Knight, you make me sad. Stop your whining, you big wookie baby. My nickname here is Chewy or Chewbacca. Um, I got that nickname because uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, Chewy was a highly renowned paleontologist in his day. And, and uh, okay, it's the hair, guys. I'm not going any further than that. Obviously, I'm not tall enough. It's just the hair. <laughs> Egypt. Mm. Ow! <laughs> Made it. That's three. Oh my God! The wind is crazy today. Yeah, this wind is a bitch. Prepare for wind burn. Uh, I don't know. I think this is. Yeah, I can't even see. Yeah, let's take a uh, hold on really for stupid. a second. We've been warned about the winter sandstorms in Egypt. Now look at 
Earth, but we really didn't expect anything like this. field work for the better part of 30 years and I have to say that this is about the toughest day I've ever faced in the field. Those same winds that impeded their progress may actually be blessings in disguise. Over time, they can erode away rocks that may hide more spectacular fossils. Erosion is the paleontologist's best friend. Stromer informed us that in 1914, no bone was showing, that he had picked up every scrap of bone. But in the years since then, the processes of erosion have proceeded. And it is that process of erosion that steadily brings to the surface new, a new crop of bones. That's why we're here. Several days into the expedition, members of the Baharia Dinosaur Project have tagged hundreds of bones on the desert surface. But most turned out to be fragments, leading nowhere. Yeah, no, no, the other side may be better. I, I think this is a jacketer. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. No question. Geologists Ken Lacavera and Jen Smith join in the pursuit by studying the sediment layers in which most of the bones have been found. There are lots of, of large fragments of bone up here. Where is it? Large fragments here, a very large piece sitting here and, and there, lots of others. This is what is most exciting. These two piles do not look natural to me. I think these are spoil piles, so somebody might have dug here before at the base of Jebel El Dist, <laughs> and we know who that might be. Yeah, yeah. 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 This is an old quarry. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> well, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> the expedition team makes their first direct link to Ernst Stromer. Nearly a hundred years before Josh and his colleagues first set foot in Baharia, German paleontologist Ernst Stromer excavated tons of fossils from the same lonely patch of desert. The tragedy of Stromer's lost dinosaurs began in 1914, when Egyptian and British officials confiscated his final shipment of fossils at the port of Alexandria. The specimens did not reach Germany until 1922. When it finally got to Germany, apparently it was in fairly sad shape. Apparently it had been unpacked and repacked, and that's of course always a prescription for disaster, particularly at a time when people were not very good yet about preserving fossils. With the materials finally back in Germany, Ernst Stromer spent several more years trying to overcome these setbacks. Being a paleontologist is not just making the finds, it's also writing about them. I don't know that he was particularly unhappy to come back, although he uh, had very happy memories of being in the Middle East, I know that. Not the least because he met his wife there, of course. Stromer was still working in Egypt when he first met Elizabeth Rennebaum, the daughter of a British architect. Years later, a chance encounter in Germany led to their marriage in 1920. During the following years, the couple raised their sons, Ullmann, Gerhard, and Wolfgang, at Stromer's family seat, the 9th century castle Stromer von Reichenbach, their private haven in a quiet forest just outside of Nuremberg. My husband, although not completely uncritical of him, really worshipped him. Yes, he must have been a very good father, very strict. Stromer continued to press forward with his work, 
authoring painstakingly researched monographs describing a complex equatorial ecosystem. Stromer discovered several distinct species of T-Rex-sized predators, including Carcharodontosaurus, a carnivore with a six-foot-long skull. Carcharodontosaurus. The name means shark tooth lizard. And this is a dinosaur that was sort of the equivalent of a shark on land. It would have basically walked up to a sauropod dinosaur and probably taken a big chunk out of it and just sort of waited for it to die. But how did meat eaters like Carcharodontosaurus survive in a desert? Ken and Jen find the answer to this riddle in a layer of beach sands halfway up Jebel El Dist. Are they gorgeous? That is really sweet. We're looking here at a shallow marine environment. We see ripply cross bedding in here. The, the sand layers have a greenish tint to them, which is usually indicative of a marine environment. And just above this is a shell bed. And uh, one really interesting thing is that we're we're dealing with sediments here that are roughly 100 million years old. But these ripples, as you probably have seen in your own experience, ripples under a stream or at the beach form in a matter of seconds. So we might be looking at literally a 10 second snapshot of part of the history of the world that has then been preserved for 100 million years. It's like finding one frame out of a movie. During the past 100 million years, this area of Egypt has been a desert, an underwater landscape, a coastline, and now a desert once again. Wow. As they scale the layers of El Dist, Jen and Ken are turning the pages of a living history book, the story of our ever-changing Earth. Beautiful. You have this sense of connectedness throughout geologic time to the entire Earth. and without getting really mystical about it, that's, that's really what keeps a lot of us in this, is that feeling of connectedness through geologic time to, to what was going on way back when. We're on the coast of an ocean 100 million years ago here. The Mediterranean is sort of the last vestige of what is called the Tethy Seaway. It went all the way around the Earth, and connected what is now the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. And we're on the southern shore of that ocean. So it might be possible with the data that we found here to actually model what the Tethy Seaway was like 100 million years ago. Unlike the geology team, Jason Poole and the scientist on the other side of Jebel El Dist have watched their hopes about the Stromer pit dissolve into disappointment. We spent a lot of time uh, digging up these pits that I pressured everybody into digging, and we found one bone at the bottom, which was really broken up and not going to help us at all. A lot of fossil plant material, but yeah, nothing else. Not <laughs> all from not that lower much. layer. Yeah. This was probably a waste of two days. After that, you, you sort of start to question your own judgment calls. We took that whole mound down and that took all day. I had Probably dreamed my entire life to get to a place like Bajaria Oasis. He, no, there's I think more there's down, more. There's I was starting to feel down, like the place was going to beat us. So great there just weren't going to be any good fossils around. 